Okay, I'm start now. Dr. Vidhi, please start. Uh, ma'am, just give me one minute, ma'am. Yeah, okay, please start. Yes, yes, ma'am, just one minute. Uh, okay, ma'am, shall I start now? Yes, please start. Okay. Hello and a very good morning to the respected host, uh, the speaker, uh, the interest channel online and all the participants uh, attending this webinar, I am Dr. Vidhi Katira. Uh, I have completed my BDS from ACS Mounted Dental College, Bangalore, Karnataka, and MDS in Oral Medicine and Radiology from Narsipai Patel Dental College, Visnagar, Gujarat. Um, I am the host for today's session and the speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Pathik Dolakya. I'll be introducing Dr. Pathik within a minute. Okay. Dr. Pathik Dolakya is a well-known periodontist from Rajkot, Gujarat with a vast experience in the subject. He has completed his BDS in 2012 from DD, DDU Nadiad and Master in Periodontology and Oral Implantology in 2016 from the uh, Hemchandra Uni North Gujarat University uh, with a gold medal in a subject. Before clearing with the tough and competitive exams of GPSC, uh, he has ranked 10th in all over Gujarat. Dr. Pathik has worked as a con consultant periodontist in a reputed institutes like Rotary, Midtowns uh, Dental Hospital, Rajkot, Swaminarayan Gurukul Hospital, Rajkot, and he has also worked as a consultant periodontist in various private clinics in Rajkot, Gujarat. He has been a visiting uh, uh, consultant dent, uh, periodontist uh, in Jamnagar, Gondal, Chunagat, and Morbi. Dr. Patik Dolakya is currently working as in charge superintendent and head of the department of dentistry and He is working there since 2017. He has 18 publications in, uh, sorry, he has eight publications in reputed national and international journals under his belt. Dr. Patik Dolakya is a life member of Indian Society of Periodontology since 2017. And he has keen interest in the to topics like dental management of medically compromised patients, periodontal surgeries, diabetes and periodontium, and etc. Today, Dr. Patik Dolakya will be uh, enlightening us with his knowledge on the topic periodontal logy is much more beyond scaling. So if diagnosed properly, there can be a scope of many periodontal treatments in the patients, which might be routinely missed out and can cause a lot of endodontic and prostodontic failures. So over to you, Dr. Pathik. Thank you so much, Dr. Vidhi, for your generous introduction. Uh, first of all, a very good morning to you and to everyone who is who has spared their uh, very important time for us on this eve of Independence Day. Um, I, will you will have to fasten your seat belts. It is a roller coaster ride as far as the presentation is concerned. Uh, the the main aim of this topic today 
is that uh, there is a lot of misconception uh, amongst the general dentists and even amongst those MDS who are from a non-perio background that uh, perio is something uh, scaling and scaling is perio. So it is like that. And usually we don't take too much interest in going into uh, uh, deeper aspects of uh, periodontology and uh, a lot of things go undiagnosed, a lot of things uh, that, that are there which are, which go unnoticed and as a result of that the patient is not able to get a complete periodontal care, a stable and healthy periodontium which is a gateway to any uh, any treatment be it a restorative or prosthetic one, the stability lies with uh, the, the stable periodontal tissues. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be having a brief uh, uh, introduction regarding the same and I'll, I'll uh, go through the processes which at people at general dentist level can manage either they can manage themselves or they can refer if they know how to approach the, the periodontal tissues so I'll be sharing my screen now I'm not much tech savvy so kindly bear with me okay uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I, I would like to pr propagate on behalf of the government of India to at least hoist a flag, uh, flag uh, on your uh, on your homes or offices or wherever you are on your dental clinics for 30, from 13th to 15th of August. It's our national duty and it's a national pride. Thank you. So these are the topics which we shall be discussing today and uh, I'll be going into uh, those details which are important clinically to you and not uh, academically because we'll not be going into academic details of all these things. Uh, this is the picture which we often see, we, which we usually see when uh, we uh, we discuss about periodontology or when, whenever somebody hears about perio. Now that is scaling or oral hygiene status or plaque control or brushing or something like that. But uh, Yes, this is the mainstay of the periodontal therapy. It still remains the mainstay, but it is not actually everything. A lot of things are there. It is just the tip of iceberg, and today we'll be unleashing the depth of the iceberg. But what all we can do as periodontists, as general dentists, and how better we can uh, serve our patients. So first of all, uh, I personally believe that uh, our, our Role to I mean a uh, 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 road to successful treatment outcome lies in the diagnosis, a, a proper diagnosis, and that proper diagnosis can only be achieved by proper thorough history taking and good clinical examination. As far as the uh, clinical examination of uh, periodontium is concerned, um, the the uh, how to approach the gingiva is that we have been studying since our third year BDS regarding the history taking that uh, we need to. Uh, study the soft tissues first. We need to uh, examine the soft tissues first and then go for heart tissue examinations because often if we directly go to the teeth uh, examination, then we can miss a lot of things in the soft tissues, be it a buccal mucosa or the periodontium or whatever. So uh, first of all, we shall examine the soft tissues and as, as far as the gingival examination is concerned, the the Basic still remains the same, the color, the contour, the consistency, assessing the probing depth, which um, many a times people assess with the simpler, uh, simple explorer, but I would recommend you to go with the UNC 15 probe or, or a Williams probe. Uh, then you can measure the depth of recession, the, the, the level of recession, the attachment level. Uh, I'll not be going into detail of explaining what is a recession, what is attachment level, what is probing depth, because uh, I know Dr. Simran in her previous lecture had nicely explained this. So I'll, uh, I'll not be repeating it and wasting your time and uh, and because there's a lot more to discuss right now. So uh, subgingival areas need to be measured, then furcation status, uh, that is uh, we had uh, seen the furcations grade one, two, three, four and all and uh, assessment of the degree of calculus, especially the subgingival ones, which may not be seen visibly. So we need to check it with a probe or an explorer and uh, then um, go for a 
comprehensive uh, treatment regarding that. Otherwise, what happens is that if supragingival calculation uh, calculus has been eliminated, but the disease doesn't go there, uh, uh, get eliminated, and many a times we get baffled of how to deal with it. But actually, the subgingival flakes are still there, which are the causes of the which are the culprits sometimes. So that also needs to be evaluated. As far as the dental evaluation is concerned, we all are very much uh, keen in doing this and often skipping the uh, soft tissue part, but uh, this we all know what to check, the mobility, the occlusion, the caries, the contact relationships, etc. Now this, I, I would request you all to uh, capture the screen. Uh, it's very important, of course, is found in your periodontal uh, periodontology textbooks like uh, Paranza and all, but uh, this is a chart of very much importance. Like the prognosis, that is the outcome of our treatment, depends on these factors. So we need to be very careful in assessing these uh, these factors, which are broadly divided into two aspects: the overall and the local factors. And uh, for example, here in the chart, as you can see, the patient's age is mentioned. Like. If the age of the patient is less, we more often we uh, say that the prognosis will be good. But if we if we look at it in the other way, the same amount of severity of disease if we find in an elderly patient, that means the disease progression is slow. But if, uh, for example, aggressive periodontitis comes up with attachment loss and bone loss, and uh, uh, general periodontitis comes with an attachment loss and bone loss, so the severity of uh, bone loss within a tender age is a questionable prognosis compared to the one that is happening at the elderly age. The, of course, the disease severity, the plaque control, how the patient manages, and most important thing is patient compliance. If your patient is not able to comply, I would suggest you not to go for any high-end procedures, any, any sort of high-end procedures, be it periodontal or restorative. So the patient compliance is a very important factor in in determining the prognosis, of course, the systemic diseases and conditions, the stress levels, smoking, the local factors which are mentioned here, all these have a very good uh, impact and these have to be critically evaluated before, before you select a particular treatment for the patient. This is one more screen that one needs to look out for and uh, one needs to you know, get a screenshot of it. Uh, the periodontal therapy has been uh, divided into many phases. Uh, this is maybe if you can consider a periodontal therapy or in general any therapy, this uh, is equally true for all. Uh, the first and foremost is the preliminary phase, that is a stage of emergencies where you you remove the dental or periapical or periodontal emergencies that are there. For example, a pain. The patient comes with the pain, you assess that, that is an emergency for you. A swelling, it can be an extraoral or an intraoral swelling or whatever. That emergency has to be dealt with first. You cannot go for a, a, a flap surgery directly. You just, you just need to approach things step by step. Uh, so the emergency things have to be assessed first. That includes extraction of hopeless teeth also. Then comes your first phase as far as the periodontal therapy is concerned, and it is also called non-surgical therapy or the etiotrophic phase. Etiotrophic means uh, the, the cause related. That is, for example, if there is gingival inflammation, the cause is plaque and calculus, so you need to eliminate that. So scaling and root planning comes under the phase one therapy. Then the diet control, minor orthodontic root mo uh, tooth movement, then Restorations. For example, if you remove remove the caries because it it is a source of food lodgement and all. If you remove the caries, that comes into phase one. But uh, the restorative phase is a different one. But here, temporary restorations or permanent, depending upon the tools you are addressing, the, the whether you can assess a definitive diagnosis or not. That all. Uh, definitive prognosis or not, that all comes under the phase one therapy. Uh, provisional splinting and prosthesis. So that the word here is provisional and uh, occlusal therapy. So all this comes under the phase one therapy. Then comes your evaluation of your non-surgical fa phase that is usually done after 28 days. Uh, that is pocket depth, you remeasure the pocket depth, remeasure the inflammation, check for the changes, and then you can decide whether to go for 
a maintenance phase or, or you, you need to go for a surgical phase. And the surgical phase, of course, in, uh, includes periodontal therapy of surgical kind, that is a flap surgery or gingivectomy or be it any periodontal therapy, including that of placements of implants. And then your root canals also come under the phase two therapy. The third phase is the restorative phase, that is a final restoration with removable prosthodontics. Uh, pr uh, prosthetic appliances and all. So the restorative phase is the phase three one and the phase four is the maintenance phase. After all these phases, you need to evaluate the patient and there is a Marines classification for that uh, and uh, when to recall the patients um, and um, that periodic recall and follow up visits are must and you need to check the things. Uh, if at all the conditions are worsening, then you can intervene and you can go for any other therapy. This is the basic chart we need to follow. The first one is the emergency phase, then the non-surgical phase, and then the phase four comes, not the phase two directly or phase three. So it is not phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. It is the emergency phase followed by phase one, followed by phase four. And then if the patient does not need any further treatment, phase one and phase four are uh, okay. But if at all the patient needs it, then from, from phase four, you directly go to the surgical phase. If at all the patient doesn't require the surgery, you go for the restorative phase. So this is how the cycle goes and this is to be kept in mind uh, to achieve a uh, to achieve a certain uh, treatment outcome which is predictable and which is long-term sustainable. Trauma from occlusion, which is often uh, unseen as far as the, the examination part is concerned. A lot of times we see computer uh, sessions and we see mobility we see a lot of uh, wear facets and all, and we often overlook this. So my suggestion would be whenever you uh, examine the gingiva, whenever you examine the oral cavity, you should always assess the trauma from occlusion. The best thing is to look for clinical exam uh, indicators, which are mentioned here in your screen. That is, you can go for a fermenter's test. You can put your, uh, dampen your finger uh, in water and then uh, without gloves, you have to put the put one of uh, your finger uh, in such a way that half of it remains on the gingiva and half of it remains on the tooth. And then you can ask the patient to, uh, you know, close the jaws uh, for occlusion trauma from occlusion. Uh, then mob mobility, which is uh, fairly progressive, then occlusal discrepancies, wear facets, tooth migration thermal sensitivity also and fractured teeth. These are all indicators of presence of trauma from occlusion, which are which is many a times. I, I personally have seen a lot of cases in which this is overlooked and the entire success of the of the therapy is geoparadise. So uh, this has to be checked. The radiographic features also are there. They like PDL widening and thickening of lamina dura, a funnel shaped PDL widening to be precise. Uh, there can or there may or may not be vertical bone loss. So all these things have to be assessed. This is a very important thing which should not be missed. If it is missed, your your uh, entire therapy, be it a restorative one or or, a, or an endodontic one, that can get you paradise. And this I'm telling you with my experience. This is a very important thing which you should always look out for. It is controversial. It is not the uh, uh, some say it is a cause of periodontal disease, but if it is uh, uh, not even a cause, it, if it is a predisposing factor or an aggravating factor, still this should not be overlooked and uh, this should always be assessed. Uh, one of the treatments is selective occlusal grinding uh, that can be done that, of course, everyone knows how to do it. Uh, then comes your splinting. Uh, this is something which uh, periodontists do very often, but uh, it is missing in the general dentists and non-perio professionals. So in this, suppose if you have an isolated tooth mobility of class, uh, grade one or something, grade one or near grade two mobility of an isolated tooth or one or two teeth, then you can do this type of uh, type of splinting, be it a temporary one or a or a permanent one, depending on the situation. Situation, you can you can do splinting. It can be done with an with a wire, ligature wire splinting. It can be done with composites, or can be done with fibers that are splinting uh, that are readily available in the market. All you need to do is you should in, uh, incorporate a sufficient number of teeth uh, that um, uh, that are firm enough to hold, uh, hold 
the the mobile teeth, uh, mobile tooth or teeth, and then you can uh, splint it uh, and give uh, support to the tooth uh, until it becomes periodontally firm. This, of course, has to be done after eliminating all sorts of periodontal conditions like plaque uh, uh, or calculus or everything. And then and then it, it has to be done. Now you should have to take care that it doesn't uh, create a source of uh, plaque or calculus and uh, it doesn't imprint with the occlusion, doesn't irritate the adjacent tissues and all. And this is how you splint, um, mostly in the uh, lower uh, anteriors, it is to be done on the lingual aspect and um, uh, at times on the uh, in the maxillary incisors, it can be done on the buccal aspect. Then there is one thing which is often not done by um, general dentist, but it, if incorporated in your therapy, uh, it can give you a lot of rewards. Uh, it is something which is non-surgical also and something which can be easily managed also. Uh, uh, for uh, the reason, this is something which which is new for you. So I'll explain it. It is a some it is a delivery of a local drug, be it an antiseptic or an uh, or an um, uh, antibiotic in your gingival or periodontal pocket. The pocket depth uh, should be around five to six mm. That is mild to moderate pocket, not more than that, because beyond seven to eight mm, uh, flap surgery is a better option. But uh, in cases where uh, only scaling would not suffice and you don't want to go for the surgical therapy or the patient doesn't want to go for a surgical therapy or is medically compromised, you can always go for this. Now, systemic antibiotics, uh, it takes a lot of antibiotics to reach the gingival cravicular fluid. Uh, and so this can be done easily with the help of local. The same amount of concentration can be achieved locally when uh, when it is placed inside the uh, gingival or periodontal pocket. And uh, this is, uh, I'll show you the diag uh, diagram. Now, this, this is the rationale behind that, that bacteria often are in a form of biofilm, that is an organized structure and not an isolated bacteria. So very difficult for the systemic antibiotics to penetrate the biofilm. So of course, we give um, um, antibiotic therapy in periodontal therapy as an adjunct to scaling and root planning, but if, local drug delivery is done, then it can uh, avoid the systemic side effects of the drug, drug and still achieve a measurable con concentration. So as far as this is concerned, still it is adjunct to scaling and running. You cannot place the uh, drug inside the pocket uh, directly. Just uh, You just need to clean the area first. Scaling and running is a must. Then and then only this can be done. It, this, can, this is better for isolated teeth in patients uh, who do not want to go for surgical therapy and uh, it is a less invasive treatment. So the contraindications are of course hypersensitivity to the drug and 7 to 8 mm or deeper pockets. Uh, these are the advantages as I have previously mentioned that it can you can achieve a higher concentration, the, you can uh, avoid resistance, you can avoid super infection and broad spectrum can be easily employed. And these are the market uh, available drugs that it that is tetracycline, acticide, doxycycline, etridox. Uh, these are available in the form of fibers or gels. Uh, I'll show you the diagram of that so that you can get a better idea. For example, this here in the Depend dish is a tetracycline fiber. What you need to do is you can get this is readily available in the market. You can uh, take the fiber, insert it into the pocket and just leave it. This is how uh, it is done. And then chips also can be placed inside, uh, similar to fibers. So this is something if you add in your armamentarium, it can be of great help to you and your patients. Now, there are always limitations with the non-surgical therapy. Where you cannot achieve everything with the uh, non-surgical therapy. Otherwise, the periodontist would not be earning anything. So... Uh, Surgical therapy is often indicated in patients like this. That is, many a times the limitations are inadequate debridement in deeper pockets. Then uh, residual calculus may be found. You cannot approach the osseous topography because if you want to go for a resective or a regenerative surgery, uh, osseous uh, remodeling, then of course surgery is indicated for patient areas that, that are difficult to reach. Uh, non-surgically. All these 
need to be assessed surgically. These are the considerations for surgical therapy like uh, deeper pockets, deeper peritoneal pockets or deeper attachment loss, uh, especially when the patient is unable to maintain the hygiene. Now, why do we need to go for a surgical therapy? Because we need to assess we need to assess those areas where we, are, we aren't able to remove the debris or black or calculus from the deeper aspects with uh, simple scaling or root planning. So in such areas that is of deeper pocket depth and all, then in mucogingival problems uh, we, know, we need to go for. Then we need to, if uh, there is any sort of uh, bone related problem that is osseous topography is to be altered, then surgical therapy is to be done. Of course, patient compliance, age, systemic condition, everything has to be checked. Aesthetic considerations, if it is in aesthetic zone, everything has to be assessed for before going for a surgical therapy. This is one of the simplest uh, forms of uh, surgical therapy, peritoneal therapy, which even I feel a general dentist can do if he needs he, he has proper armamentarium with him and uh, proper knowledge regarding this. Uh, this was previously explained nicely by Dr. Simran in her previous lecture. Uh, she had uh, stated the difference between true pocket and pseudo pockets. So pseudo pockets where there is gingival en enlargement, where there is pocket uh, uh, growth coronal to the uh, margin of gingiva and coronal to the attachment without any attachment loss, it is a pseudo pocket. So in pseudo pockets, gingival, uh, gingivectomy can be done. Uh, the rationale behind this is to access the root uh, cavity in, in and pocket elimination as far as supra, uh, supra bony pockets are concerned. Uh, to achieve physiological gingival controls. And of course, this has to be done in areas with uh, pocket greater than 3 mm and with uh, pocket uh, areas with adequate zone of keratinized gingiva. Aesthetic considerations also need to be checked. Now, this is Super Mario who took a drug and got enlarged, similar to the uh, enlargement uh, that we often look uh, uh, encounter in terms of uh, drug induced gel enlargement. The most common uh, that, that mushroom coming out is uh, phenytoin or uh, nifedipin or any cyclosporin, so any immunosuppressant, uh, basically cyclosporin or a phenytoin or, uh, or um, a calcium channel blocker. So these are most often associated with drug induced gingival enlargement. These are painless bead like enlargements. Often you need to take the drug history and you will find out. It is often uh, accompanied by inflammation also. So basically, when you come across patients, you'll not be finding a textbook picture always because it will be fibro inflammatory and not just a fibrous enlargement. In such cases, you need to refer the uh, patient back to the concerned doctor who has prescribed the drug and, uh, and request him to change the drug if possible. And then after changing, you will notice that if you ask the patient to come in, in uh, subsequent follow-ups, then uh, you will notice a reduction in the enlargement. But if at all it uh, doesn't completely disappear, you need to go for a gingivectomy uh, or a gingivoplasty to, uh, to establish physiologic gingival controls. Of course, these are the contraindications. The indications included uh, thick keratinized gingiva or adequate keratinized gingiva. Here it is inadequate zone of keratinized tissue where you need to then uh, pockets reaching beyond the mucogingival line. Then when you need to assess the bones or, or intrabony pockets, which were of course explained nicely by Dr. Simran, so I'll not be classifying which are the supra and which are intrabony pockets. Uh, then patients with poor or oral hygiene, as we mentioned in the prognosis aspect also, that uh, patients having poor oral hygiene or non-compliance should not be, you know, um, entertained as far as I'm concerned, because that will only uh, add a headache to you and not be complying to you. And then they'll complain that you took so much money and I'm still with the same thing. Because in periodontium, 50% of the role is of the dentist or the periodontist and the 50% lies with the patient in the maintenance aspect. So always be careful with choosing your cases. These are the handy tools 
for gingivectomy, the pocket marker, the UNC-15 probe, then there's a gastrovisor caesar, the normal knife, the implant knife and all. Remember one thing that uh, it is always better to mark the pockets beforehand and then go for an external bevel incision. This is a diagram that nicely shows how the bleeding points have been marked and then uh, just uh, apical to that, uh, the external bevel incision is given. This was one of my cases that I had done. The incision can be continuous or discontinuous depending on the thickness of gingiva and and of course, the, the comfort of the surgeon also. This was a continuous incision. And as you can see, the gingiva has been removed. This is the uh, immediate post-operative picture. And this is post-operative one, uh, one or two months follow-up. Then comes your uh, periodontal flap surgery that, uh, of course, uh, which is a very common thing which people might have heard of that but there is a misconception a lot of people associate flap surgeries with recession also but uh, this will i mean as we go beyond this i mean uh, further in the lecture will uh, you'll have a clear idea that flap surgeries are not for uh, root coverage or recession root coverage and recession are done with the mucogingival surgeries this is a flap surgery these are the indications ideal indications of flap surgery where accessibility and visibility to the deeper areas is the first and foremost thing. For example, if your flaps, uh, uh, sorry, phase one therapy has been done and still the pockets are deep enough uh, where your instrumentation is not possible. Uh, so you need to go for a flap surgery to, to make it accessible to the surfaces where your uh, scaling instruments did not reach. Uh, then you need to eliminate the pockets, then you need to eliminate inflammation, and you need to provide an environment conducive to flag control. For the, the most important thing is patients are unable to maintain their hygiene in deeper pockets. So if you do a flap surgery, the, the pockets get reduced to a considerable size where the patients can manage the pocket. So that is the major indication of a flap surgery. Then, of course, uh, osseous resective or regenerative surgery also comes under the uh, heading of flap surgery. For example, bone grafts, GTRs, all those are done with the help of flap surgery. These are the contraindications. Of course, when you can achieve a better result with non-surgical therapy, why do you go, need to go for a surgical therapy? Then in unprepared edematous gingiva tissues, see what happens if you are uh, dealing with unprepared and edematous tissue. If your phase one has been not done properly, has not been done properly and uh, you directly jump into the phase two. A lot of times, you know, patient, uh, people do that, that uh, the patient wants to go to foreign. So I'll be doing it in, uh, in uh, a day or two or after a week, but that is ideally that should not be done because in such cases you can end up with gingival tears. So that uh, we are like that dialogue in the movie as far as the periodon is concerned pushpa i hate tears so we also hate tears because once the flap gets cured uh, it becomes a hell of a job in repairing that so it is always better to prepare a good bed prior to the surgery and at least wait for 28 to 30 days uh, before uh, assessing the uh, the condition once again and then you can decide whether to go for a flap or not then in certain medically compromised patients where you cannot go for a surgery, then of course, as I said, that poor oral hygiene or a bad, bad patient compliance and the patient attitude toward the treatment and the teeth with hopeless prognosis, all sorts of these, uh, these things are contraindications. Otherwise, you can go for a flap surgery. Uh, concept of critical probing depth was nicely explained by Simonon, uh, Dr. Simonon, and uh, again I'll say that it is a depth that is a level be below which, if you go for any treatment, it, the, the prognosis will not be good. So, if this is a very good example, see the the, the numbers mentioned here are 4.5 mm for molars and 6 to 7 mm for incisors, which means that if you go for a flap surgery in a 3 mm pocket, you will not be uh, ending with a good attachment gain. In fact, you will be ending with an attachment loss. So it is always better to go for a flap surgery in which the uh, uh, probing depth is more like the ones which are indicated here. 
but this is only a guideline and not in particular so it is your job to assess the situation clinically and then to decide whether a flap surgery is beneficial or not so the risk and benefits always need to outweigh it first before deciding for the surgery but this is a general guideline which can help you just remember a pocket depth which is persisting even after the phase 1 therapy that is of greater than 5 mm uh, is or can be considered a candidate for flap surgery of course uh, assessing the other condition also so these are uh, this can help help you as a guide but if if you go for a flap surgery for in a 2 mm crevice you will be end up ending up with a attachment loss rather than an attachment gain so these are the basic techniques uh, for a flap surgery this is a, a normal conventional flap with a trabecular incision where a flap is exposed uh one 1 mm of bone is expo exposed and then you can uh, go for the scaling or removal of of defects whatever uh, is needed uh basically the incisions are divided into two broad aspects the horizontal incision and the vertical incision vertical relieving incisions are of course uh, done for uh, flaps and uh, or involving gtr membranes and bone grafts and all uh where you need to uh, then then there is apically reposition flap and all but um in most of the flap surgeries only horizontal incisions would suffice and these are the examples of the horizontal incision the figure a is of internal bevel incision the figure b i mean the two number that is shown here is the crevicular incision and the third one is the interdental incision so it uh, it goes in this way the first incision has to be an internal bevel one the second one the navicular and the third the interdental but in some cases where there is less amount of um, uh, the, the, the gingiva is thin or in aesthetic zones or in areas where you don't need to eliminate Uh, the entire pocket lining cravicular incisions can be done as and and in cases where the flaps need to be displaced only a cravicular incision and an interdental incision is more than enough so these are the indications of an internal bevel incision remember in gingivectomy we used to do an external bevel where the bevel came from apical to coronal aspect here the bevel is coming from the coronal to apical aspect reaching the tip of the bone where you can do a proper bone sounding and then you can reach the tip of the bone and then you can incise and so these are the indications for uh, the internal bevel incision it removes the pocket lining and gives a sharp and thin knife edge gingival margin which adapts well to the tooth this is of course the simplest form i would recommend people who are going for flap surgeries and uh, do not come from a periodontal background Uh, should ideally go for a crevicular incision and uh, directly open the uh, flap uh, because in this it is simpler in in internal bevel incision you may need an expertise and experience to you know deal with that but here this is very simple you can directly enter uh, enter your knife into the gingival crevice or the, or the blade in the gingival crevice and reach the top of the bone and then go uh, accordingly these are the vertical incisions as i mentioned the more the most important thing is either the papilla is fully included or the papilla is fully excluded you cannot just incise from in between the papilla because this compromises the vas uh, compromises the vascular supply then comes your suturing uh, there are a lot of techniques like mattress sutures the horizontal mattress the vertical mattress and all the continuous intermittent everything but these are the basic sutures which you also can take uh, these are the figure of eight sutures and simple loop sutures in case of simple loop you enter the gingiva um, uh, from the buccal aspect and exit from the lingual aspect and in case of figure of eight you enter it from the buccal aspect go out then again enter from the lingual aspect and then tie a knot on the buccal aspect um as far as my personal experience is concerned figure of eight sutures are easier than the simple loop ones but it is up to you how you manage the case and one thing is to be done that draw an imaginary line uh, at the base of the triangle of the papilla and that has uh, that the needle has to be inserted uh, apical to the base of the papilla and that is how you 
maintain the papilla in a healthy relationship and maintain the blood supply. Otherwise, that can get teared if you open it too for uh, if you enter it too coronally. Then comes your distal molar surgery. Often uh, we experience pockets distal to the last molar, last standing molar. Uh, if it is a mandibular one, you can go for a triangular incision like this one shown in the figure, and then suture it out after removing the uh, the etiological factors over there and then uh, uh, if it is an upper molar you can go for a rectangular incision that is shown here this is often overlooked a lot of times we need to probe the distal aspect of the last standing molar and uh, if at all it is a source of for infection it, if at all it is not in a healthy relationship if at, all, if at all it is very deep then you can go for this surgery to provide a good stable um, Periodontium over there. Now, this is something uh, which is also often overlooked and uh, many a times uh, not so well understood concept. That is a guided tissue regeneration. Many a times you might have seen that people are placing uh, GDR membranes and uh, also putting bone grafts in inside. There is something called a Melcher's concept. Now, this is very simple to understand once we apply our minds over there. The, the rate at which the periodontal ligament cells and the bone cells, the osteoblasts, they divide and uh, form the bone or a periodontal ligament. That rate is very much slower as compared to the epithelial turnover rate or the epithelial cell division and the epithelial healing. So what happens that if the membrane is not placed in between the epithelium uh, and the bone, sometimes what happens is that the epithelial cells, which have a faster rate of migration, they tend to occupy the space in which the bones, bone is supposed to be formed, leading to a healing by long junctional epithelium, which we don't want. We want the tissue to regenerate. So what we do is we keep, keep a barrier membrane that does not allow the epithelial cells to move further into the area where the bone grafts uh, has been placed. This gives a sufficient time to the bone graft materials to form the bone uh, in the area, and then we can go. Uh, we can have a better uh, periodontal outcome with a better periodontal regeneration as compared to the healing with long junctional epithelium. Again, these are the indications: class two furcation, intrabony defect, three wall defects are the best. Uh, Three wall or two wall defects are best for bone grafts. One wall defects are not good. Horizontal defects should never be uh, de dealt with a bone graft because it is of no use. The bone graft would not stay there. Of course, the topography of uh, uh, wall defects was nicely explained by Dr. Simran. What I would like to add here is you can draw an imaginary line um, from CEJ of one tooth to the CEJ of the other tooth. And if at all it lies parallel to, if at all it lies parallel to the underlying uh, bone, then uh, that is considered to be a horizontal defect. If at all it is not parallel, it is a vertical defect. I'll, as you can see here in the in the radiograph, an imaginary line has been drawn from one CJ to, to the other, and the underlying bone also is parallel to the uh, uh, to that line. So it is not a vertical bone loss. Of course, this, this figure doesn't uh, uh, easily show you the uh, bone loss also. But uh, if at all the line wasn't parallel, then it was a good uh, case of uh, vertical bone loss. Here, if you in this radiograph, if you draw a parallel line, uh, line connecting the two CJs, you can see that the V-shaped bone loss is that is a, that line is not parallel to that the, the imaginary line. So it is a vertical bone loss, which is an ideal case of bone graft. As far as the bone grafts are concerned, they are broadly uh, having three characteristics. The best one is osteogenic. That is, it biologically forms the new bone. The bone graft itself forms the new bone. The autografts, like bones taken from elsewhere or in, within the intraoral cavity, or the, that those sorts of uh, bone grafts are autogenous or, or osteogenic. They form the bone by itself. Then is osteoinductive. The word osteoinductive means that the bone graft 
material doesn't form the bone by itself, but it induces the neighboring cells to form the bone. It, it chemically uh, signals the, um, the neighboring cells to form the new bone over there. So, so they are uh, inductive, also inductive uh, uh, material that you might have heard of for DFDBA, that is the decalcified freeze dried mineral bone draft. Those are um, osteo inductive. Then the most common ones are osteoconductive. Most of the alloplastic materials or xenografts are osteoconductive. They just give a physical platform over which the neighboring cells will eventually come and form the bone. So it doesn't induce the neighboring cells, but if it stays there until uh, some neighboring cells would come there and they uh, would form the bone. So it's like the difference is if I call you out for some, uh, for dinner, uh, it is an osteoinductive. And if you yourself get self-invited, you come to, to my place for a dinner, it is osteoconductive. I have not invited you. So this is the difference between osteoinductive and osteoconductive. Of course, osteogenic forms the bone by itself. So this is how bone grafting is done. This is something called PRF. That is, it can be used as a membrane also, platelet-rich fibrin. What we do is we we withdraw 10 ml of blood from the patient's uh, body. Then uh, we collect it in a simple test tube and we centrifuge it for 10 minutes at 300 RPM. Then we find, we get a jelly-like material. This is very easy to do it. You also can do it in your clinics if you have a lab support. And then uh, this jelly-like membrane is a very good source of uh, growth factors. This increases the soft tissue healing uh, in a very nice way and it, it also uh, um, in, induces a good bone formation also. So BRF is some, like something is better than nothing. If you, have a, uh, if you have a vertical defect, if the patient is not going for a bone graft, you can at least put a BRF inside that. So it, something is better than nothing. Of course, bone grafts are better, but BRF also give a good uh, soft tissue and hard tissue healing as compared to the ones which are carried out without its usage because it is a very good source of um, uh, growth factors like platelet derived growth factor and IGF and all. Then of course, endoperiod relationships, you can find it out from the radiographs and all. But one thing is for sure, the most important thing to be uh, to take on home is that be it an endoperio lesion or a pendo Perio, uh, pendo, uh, uh, lesion or an endoperio lesion, the, the, the first and foremost thing is the root canal treatment. The endodontic therapy always precedes the periodontal therapy because what happens is that if you do a periodontal therapy first, that the canal is not sealed, then the infection from the canal would again go into the periodontium. But once you have achieved a 3D sealing of the root canal, then it is up to us to just uh, uh, seal the uh, periodontium or clean the periodontium effectively to eliminate the infection completely. So in cases of an endoperio, that is a primary endo and a secondary perio or a perio endo, primary perio with secondary endo, or if you are unable to diagnose uh, the source, always go for a root canal first. And after that, uh, four to six weeks after that, you can reassess the situation and go for a periodontal therapy, surgical periodontal therapy if needed. Uh, this is something which is often not considered while, uh, uh, while diagnosis, but it is a very important thing. Uh, mucogingival surgeries, and this is often misunderstood with the flap surgeries also. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people, you know, tend to call me up that doctor, I have a case of recession, can you come for a flap surgery? But flap surgery is something which is not uh, done for root coverage. Mucogingival surgeries are done for root coverage. And mucogingival uh, surgeries or periodontal plastic surgeries, or uh, as it is said, not only include root coverage surgeries, but this is an umbrella which includes all these things that, that are appearing on your screen. Be it a ridge augmentation as far as implants are concerned, be it a crown lengthening, then the coverage of denuded root surfaces, reconstruction of papilla, perioprosthetic corrections, etc. All come under the area of mucogingival surgeries or periodontal plastic surgeries. 
these are the objectives that is to attain an adequate zone of attached gingiva to eliminate or pockets that reach beyond mucous gingival line remember if the pockets are uh, not extending beyond the mucous gingival line the flap surgery is more than enough but if it is extending beyond mucous gingival line then we go for a pps then the uh, phrenectomy, uh, elimination of phrenum pool, vestibular deepening as far as uh, prosthetic, pre-prosthetic surgeries are concerned. A lot of times your dentures, dentures are not stable because of the shallow vestibule. So all these things come under the periodontal plastic surgeries. This is one thing which is very much important that is concept of biological width. Uh, for a restoration to remain healthy, uh, this is very important. This concept is very important. It's like and, uh, we are, uh, we as periodontists are uh, giving a proper bed so that the prosthetic or uh, prosthetic uh, or endodontic treatment remains uh, healthy for a long time. These are the types of uh, margins that we usually place uh, as far as crowns are concerned. Now, this is something which one needs to understand. See the different. Uh, this, this is the distance, the total biological width. That is the place for, at, at CJ where your gingiva is normally attached. From that CJ or the place of attachment of your gingiva to the top of the bone is your biological uh, width. That's the crest of alveolar bone, and that is usually two mm which is more or less constant in all patients. Uh, it is actually 0 0.97 and 1.05, but if we consider the mean depth, it is one mm junctional epithelium and one mm of connective tissue. So a total of two mm gap has to be there between the uh, crest of the alveolar bone and the place where the gingiva is attached. Adding one more of sulcus depth is around 3 mm. So once if you are placing a supra gingival margin, make sure that it is 3 mm away from the bone. How do you diagnose it? You can do a bone sounding. You can do a radiographic evaluation. Or if, you, if your patient with a restoration comes up uh, with a bone loss of uh, unpredictable nature or margins remain unchanged, but the gingival inflammation develops over there, so these are all ways to identify that there might be a violation in the biological way. So always make sure that if you are going for a restoration, that 2 mm biological width has to be maintained. You can identify it radiographically. You can identify it clinically. Uh, uh, you can uh, ask the patient whether he or she is comfortable. Then you can do a bone sounding. You, you can... Uh, insert a probe and then me measure the distance towards the alveolar crest. If it is 2 mm or less, then you can go for a crown lengthening. Again, the crown lengthening comes with two options, with or without osteoplasty. Again, depends on the, the map, uh, placement where you are going to ultimately put your restorative margin. If at all, even after a gingivectomy, your margin is still 2 mm or less away from the crest of the bone, I would suggest you to go for a ground lensing with osteoplasty so that it remains at least 2 mm away from the attached uh, uh, gingiva place where, place where it is attached. Uh, sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt Dr. Patik. Uh, just yes. 15 minutes left for the webinar. No problem, so, ma'am. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, means if any attendees or the participants have questions, please they can write in the chat box. And then at the end of the session, Dr. Patik will be answering them. So if anyone has questions, please go on typing over there. Thank you. So you can go for a gingivectomy alone. That is uh, explained previously here that you don't need to uh, alter the bone topography. You just need to cut the gingiva with an external bevel incision and then uh, uh, increase the length of the crown. And... Uh, or you can go for a crown lengthening with osteoplasty where you can alter the osseous topography, reduce the bone height so that uh, it fits the, uh, the crown, new crown at its uh, place where it is in a healthy relationship with the underlying gingiva. So these are the objectives, uh, removal of subgingival caries, uh, pre preservation and maintenance of restoration, cosmetic improvement, 
So all these things are, uh, of course, the biological width and uh, facilitation of improved hygiene. So these are the objectives where you can go for a crown lengthening procedure. Many a times uh, we are getting a call that doctor, I did a crown lengthening and still my restoration is not healthy. My, my crown is not in a healthy condition. The patient is complaining of pain. But here one has failed to assess the biological width. Sometimes an osteoplasty is needed and the, the clinician might have just got the soft tissue. So, and, and remember, the bone sets the tone and the soft tissue um, follows the hard tissue. So if at all uh, the bone is there, the soft tissue is bound to regrow. So many a times, if you have to uh, remove the bone at that place, it is always um, mandatory to assess the biological width and predict whether the the new ground a new gingival margin will not be regrowing so that is how you clinically judge it always comes with an experience but uh, if you follow these steps i am, am very sure that you will be able to deal it in, in, in a better way so this is how a crown lengthening is done again if it is a simple gingivectomy go for a gingivectomy procedure like you mark the pockets and then you remove the Gingiva is an external bevel incident. If at all it is uh, requiring any osseous surgery, uh, go for an internal bevel incision, uh, as I have previously mentioned, I mentioned. Expose some sort of bone, and then you can always uh, do an osteoplasty with the help of course. I remember the match of England and New Zealand uh, in 2019, where uh, it was so edge to edge, and it just came down to when it came down to separation of both the teams for a winner. The, the boundaries mattered and here also as far as biological width is concerned the boundaries the healthy boundaries of 2 mm matter if it is getting violated you are ending up in the new zealand side so i would always uh, ask you to always 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 take some time spare some time for diagnosis do a proper bone sounding if needed take a proper radiograph and assess the biological width then and then only go for a restorative or an prosthetic procedure. These are the types of attachments now as far as the phrenectomy procedures is concerned, which is also coming under the umbrella of mucogingival surgery and which you need to know as clinicians, even if you refer a case. See what happens that many a times it is a cause of diastema. These are the types of attachments, mucosal, gingival, papillary and papillary penetrating. Many a times we end up doing phrenectomy in papillary and papillary penetrating ones to confirm whether that phrenum is in a healthy attachment or not. You can do a blanch test where you just uh, roll the upper lip and pull the phrenum and if, if at all you feel, feel a blanching that is a discoloration in the interdental papilla, that means your phrenum is uh, impringing uh, the, 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 the papilla and requires a phrenectomy. Because what happens is that when mastication takes place, this is what happens and the, the margins of gingiva get opened out and the food lodgement takes place. So this is how you uh, uh, check for the phrenal pull. Of course, then you can put a, a artery forcep and cut the rest of the phrenum and there are different types of phrenectomy, but this is the easiest one. You can um, put a artery forcep, be it one or two, and uh, catch hold of the frenum and then uh, you can cut the rest of the frenum with, uh, uh, that is coming on the sides of the artery forcep and then you can suture it out. One more thing you which you can deal with is an operculectomy. Many a times we have seen, um, especially with the third molars that they are impacted on all people go for disinfections. But if the tooth is able to come uh, eventually in the oral cavity in a, in a healthy environment and the patient is having temporary problems, what you can do is you can uh, go for an operculectomy instead and be, be conservative rather than going for a total dis, dis I mean, entire disinfection of the tooth. This is, it can be done with a pottery, it can be done with a knife, it can be done with lasers. You just need to remove the part of the uh, very uh, that is the operculum that is impinging upon the tooth and then you can clear it out. This is something which all can do as far as clinicians are concerned. Uh, as you can see, a lot of patients come with a brown pigmentation over the gingiva and uh, 
what you can do is with the help of a blade and scalpel that is the simplest method otherwise a bar and an uh, and a micro motor uh, round bar and a micro motor or with the help of lasers or with the help of pottery you can remove the epithelial layer uh, scrape it off or remove it entirely depending on the thickness of the gingiva and can give a cosmetic uh, outcome to the patient but the thing is that this may not be permanent you need to explain to your patient that it can recur but uh, if the patient is in need of any uh, any cosmetic intervention and this is something which is a bread and butter for you because nowadays cosmetic dentistry is you know progressing by leaps and bounds and this is very simple to do but most importantly don't forget to pack the epithelium epithelium because it will create um discomfort to the patient if it is not packed with a periodontal pack which are also readily available in the markets see this was my case uh, of uh, gingival deep pigmentation as i said don't forget to pack then comes your recession for which uh, the surgery is had to be done for root coverage uh, these are the causes minimal attached gingiva renal pull tooth small position and the predisposing factors of course inflammatory uh, inflammation related to plaque improper brushing iatrogenic dental care sullivan atkins classified this as shallow narrow shallow wide deep narrow deep wide and uh, this is miller's classification which i'm sure you might have been asked in your period why was in your fourth year bds so i'll not be going into detail uh, the the interdental papilla is the key here if at all the interdental papilla is intact and there is no bone loss or soft tissue loss then the uh, the recession may be class 1 or class 2 depending on whether it extends beyond the mucogingival junction or not see whenever root coverage surgeries are to be planned most important thing is the type of recession class 3 and class 4 recessions like here as shown in the figure are not very good candidates for root coverage the root coverage achieved will only be partial or may not even be achieved so it is always better to go for a root coverage surgery depending on whether it is class 1 or class 2 recession which will give you a better uh, aesthetic outcome so never attempt a, a mucogingival surgery or any sort of surgery as far as your class 4 recession is concerned it is of no use so don't just rush to convince the patient if on seeing the recession yes that is possible i'll call my periodontist friend and he'll do it for us no class 3 and class 4 recessions are not having a proper uh, outcome so it is always better to do the best one is of course uh, shallow narrow or a deep narrow uh, as far as sullivan atkins is concerned and a class 1 recession is concerned the clinical significance is of course um, root caries then uh, sensitivity and all so, um, attached mucogingiva is not uh, attached gingiva is not there so difficult in maintaining uh, the hygiene and all so these are all symptoms and uh, clinical significance the procedures are free gingival graft coronally positioned flap uh pedi uh, pedicle flap semilunar flap and all sorts of these but there is a disclaimer uh, that once you see it in, when we were kids we used to watch wwe fights in that there is a there was a disclaimer do not try this at home i would suggest you not to try this at in your clinics if you are not from a periodontal background because uh, it is a challenging thing even for a periodontist because the treatment outcome the, the prognosis is not always uh, predictable and that is the reason why it should not be ideally be attempted by um, a general dentist or a person who is in an mds and not in the periodontal aspect but um, again uh, if done with caution if learnt with proper techniques this can be done um, but proper case selection is very important the, the most important aspect here is what what to do when to do and when not to do many a times we end up in trouble without doing any sort of uh, mistakes in the surgery because the case selection itself was not proper so um, it is always better to call up periodontist friend uh, and ask him whether this is possible or not you can go for a clinical picture and a radiograph and show it to him and then once he approves then you can always go for a uh, you can always go for convincing the patient later 
conclusion, scaling and route planning is a very, very important aspect of periodontal therapy, but of course, not the mainstay, and of course, not the only one. A lot of things uh, are there. I have tried to cover those which were clinically important to you, and um, it is obviously difficult to, uh, to, you know, master a thing in one hour, so it is not practically possible. Uh, so I have tried to restrict my um, my discussion to things which were relevant and clinically important and which might have might help you in future uh, future either you can do it on your own or you can uh, call your periodontist friend and your, your patient gets a proper clinical outcome uh, but a lot needs to be discussed it is still a wide topic i can understand your situation right now um, i too am feeling the same because i'm not used to you know keep on talking this much so thank you all. Have a nice Sunday. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Vidhi. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratik. It was a very wonderful and informative webinar today. Anyone has questions, please type in question answer box or the chat box here on the screen. Uh, till then, I'll be uh, sharing my PPT for dentist channel online, okay? Just a moment. Okay. So dentist channel online is the first digital dental media. Okay, uh, it gives the academic, professional, and conferential needs of dental students, practitioners, organizations, businesses, and dental industry leads. They offer several services and a variety of platform, all under one roof. So, uh, what all includes in Dentist Channel Online? Okay, you can go to the website Dentist Channel Online. Okay, so the services they are uh, providing uh, to dentists, to the prof uh, professionals. Okay, so the they are dental news. When you go on the site of Dentist Channel Online, okay, so there will be dental news. There will be the webinars, the upcoming webinars, and already the webinars which have been conducted. That list will also be there. Uh, there are various courses you can attend. There are the events. There are the premium videos. There is prime membership. There is, uh, uh, you, if you want, you can submit the scientific article. Uh, you can contribute the videos of your clinics or uh, any other um, webinars. If you have given, you can contribute your videos over there. Okay. So for dental organization and in the from the point of view of business, okay, it helps in hosting events, graphic designing, social media marketing, website development, participant certificates, event registration, consultation services, content writing and designing. Uh, it helps in listing your business and advertise too. Okay, then this channel uh, online, okay, Healthy Smiles and uh, Wealthy Lives, okay. They have conducted 700 plus live webinars, 25 plus dental workshops, 4,000 plus participant certifications have been issued till now. 400 plus national and international speakers uh, have given their uh, webinars on dental channel online. 300 plus oral care videos under Save the Tooth program. Okay, this is the certificate. Okay, uh, they take the pride in sharing this dentist channel online certificate. Uh, they have uh, entered into the India Book of Records of having maximum speakers participating in virtual conference and oral implantology. Okay, this uh, virtual conference and oral implantology was conducted in the month of November, and I was the keynote speaker of the same. I am very proud to be a part of it. Okay, so there is a. Uh, Prime membership also, okay. 
So what are the benefits of Prime member? Okay, you get the personalized account in the channel dot online with the access to the profile, uh, access to all the webinars organized by Dentist Channel Online. Uh, speed this okay. There is special discount uh, for all the dental courses if you want to do regular updates and news about dentistry. Certification will be uh, rec will be given as a recognized institute with CPD or CDE points. Okay, you can download your certificates from your profile anytime you want. Uh, publish uh, public awareness videos. Okay, means uh, if you have done something for the public, okay, which awares them. Okay, so you can upload that videos even. You can participate as a speaker. Access to scientific articles and recorded webinars. So these are the memberships. Uh, these are the benefits of being a prime member for dentist channel dot online. Okay, this will be the certificate. Okay, like the certificate of participants will be given from Dentist Channel online. Okay, so when uh, if you be a prime member of Dentist Channel online, you can get participant certificate after every webinar. Okay, and uh, e certificate with one FDA Germany CPD point exclusive for the prime members only. Okay, it is uh, seven nine nine per year. It's nothing more, which is equivalent to ten dollars. Uh, 10 US dollars. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever you uh, want to be a prime member, okay, you can go to the site. Okay. It is 800 or uh, 799 rupees per year. And when you use this promo code AP100, okay, you will get a discount over there even. Okay. So these are the two upcoming webinars. Okay. Uh, Tomorrow, uh, sorry, uh, it's on first. This is optimizing mechanical plaque control, evidence-based approach for clinical practice. This will be on 18th August. Okay, and the guest speaker will be Dr. Ashwin Parakhre and the host will be Dr. Artna Pandya. Uh, the next uh, upcoming webinar will be on 19th August. Uh, it will be in, uh, at night, 8.30 p.m. as per Indian Standard Time. Okay, how to become a UK licensed dentist, a podcast for overseas dentists. The guest speaker will be Dr. Sara Zubair and the host will be Dr. Sara Mustafa. Okay, so you can follow Dentist Channel online on Facebook, Twitter, Insta, LinkedIn, YouTube, WhatsApp, and uh, you can register it uh, at 799 per year. So this is the address, Dentist Channel Online Private Limited, Bandra, East Mumbai, India. Corporation identification number, the GST number is uh, displayed here. And the email ID is info at dentistchannel.online. And the website where you can register and you can see the this courses or you can upload the videos, it's www.dentistchannel.online. Thank you. Okay, any questions anyone have? Oh, I think everything is clear with the everyone. Okay, there are no questions. Uh, Dr. Patek needs to answer them, I guess. Just a moment. Okay, uh, I guess there are no questions. So we'll end this webinar over here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patik, for being a knowledgeable speaker for today's session on periodontics. Yeah, I, I would like to thank Dentist Channel Online and I would like also like to thank you for being a wonderful host and uh, providing the platform to me for uh, sharing my views on, on the topic. Thanks a lot, Dentist Channel Online and Dr. Vidhi. Thank and you so much, Dr. Patel. Thank you to Patek. all the listeners who took their time out.
Yes, thank you so much, attendees or the participants who spent the valuable time on Sunday. And I thank Dentist Channel Online for giving me this opportunity to host this webinar today. Thank you so much and have a good day.